Bismillah. Uh, Sundas, Sundas, in the mic. All right, Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar rahman rahim uh, One announcement before we start. Uh, try to fill in as much as you can. The over, the over uh, fill is going to be in roots because the MPH they're working on. Uh, next week, inshallah, we're going to be in the MPH, uh, inshallah ta'ala, to fit everyone in, inshallah ta'ala. So from next week, we'll be in the, the room behind, inshallah ta'ala. Play it. Um, Bismillah. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Allahumma inna nas'aluka hubbak wa hubba man yuhibbuk wa hubba amalin yuqarribuna ila hubbik ya arhamar rahimin. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this a gathering by which we increase our knowledge. And then we increase in knowledge that motivates us forward in our journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, last week, we were introducing this amazing book by Imam Ghazali, rahimahullah ta'ala. Um, and for those who weren't with us last week, and for all of us, as a reminder, um, he wrote this book as his final book, as a pathway or a, um, a, a, a guide for us to become true servants of Allah and true worshipers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Imam Ghazali, rahimahullah ta'ala, he says that, like, like, on this path, there are many hurdles that you're going to meet on the way. And the thing is, if you know what's coming all the, all, already, then you're already mentally prepared for it, right? You're already ready for what's coming. Not only that, he literally breaks down how to surmount all of these hurdles, how to get, get over each and one of these hurdles, inshallah. So last week, the hurdle that he talked about, um, it really hit me. It was the hurdle of knowledge. And last week, what he said was, the very first thing that you need to even start this journey is you need knowledge that wakes you up to reality. And the best, and the best analogy that I could give you is my personal experience. It's like the moment that I found out about this deen, Islam, the moment that I, I found out about, you know, angels writing good deeds and bad deeds, the moment I, I found out that this prophet came with this message, then it was like, I want to worship now. I want to do what I need to do to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so what he said last week was heavy. He said that um, when knowledge comes within you, then that's the first step. You'll find within yourself this desire to want to act upon that, right? And so one thing I'll say is as you grow in your level, as you become, you know, more, you know, woke to these realities, woke to these realities, then things change for you. You know, like when you're first trying to get in shape, like all you look at is like caloric intake, right? And then after a while, you like my macros, my micros, you know what I mean? You start, uh, you start getting more into it, more like detailed into certain things. So similarly, um, I'm going to talk about because the next, the next hurdle is a deep one. I I'm just going to get right into it. Okay. So Imam Ghazali, rahimahullah ta'ala. Oh, I got to preface one thing, y'all. Why y'all ain't smiling? Y'all ain't no smiles up here. Uh, good. It's going to be heavy, but still, you can smile, you know what I mean? Make it easier, inshallah. Listen, Imam Ghazali is known as the, um, the bullet point master. So, like, he'll say, for example, there's seven hurdles. Then he'll be like, hurdle four, 4A, 4B, 4C, 4D, which, which is fun. It's interesting because it's kind of like, oh, wow, it's so detailed. But the beautiful thing is we actually want the detail because it's detailing for us how to pragmatically implement this spiritual reform in our lives. And so I want us to appreciate the detail and, 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 and also just make dua for the scholars of our ummah, right? Going back to our mother Aisha radiallahu anha and all of the sahaba and all of the scholars who left us 900 years ago, this amazing text for us today to reflect upon on how are we going to get back home. Um, and so uh, let's just get straight into it, insha'Allah ta'ala. Um, he says, Once you've gained some knowledge, and you know what God wants from you. Again, coming from darkness, that was the biggest question. What does God want from me? From the age of, of, of seven, I was aware of God. I was aware, but I didn't know what he wanted from me, right? And on top of that, just to share with some depth, at coming from Christianity, Islam was like, yo, you got one God to please. That's it. 
But for me coming from Christianity, that was so deep because before it was like, well, who do I worship? What's the God that I worship? Who do I listen to? But again, once you gain that knowledge, what did he say? You gain knowledge and now you begin to act. Now you get knowledge, right? You're like, oh, I got to pray. Oh, I got to do this. Oh, I have to do that. And now you get this, this desire to now do ibadah. And you want to do it. You want to be busy with it. But something happens. You look at yourself in the mirror. You look and you're like, oh my God, I got so many sins. I got so many sins. And he says, this is almost everyone's situation. You're ready to move forward. And, and, and this is where shaitan, this is where shaitan really gets us. Because he lets us focus on the sins to a point where they stop us from having the desire to move forward. That we're not worthy of this journey. This journey is for the elite. Who are you? Who are you? And I'll, I'll say it once, I'll say it again. That our, our spiritual spaces are not country clubs for the elite pious people. They're hospitals for the sick people. And so if you're the one who's covered in sins, you're at the right place. As long as you got coffee before you came. <laughs> as long as you stopped that soap on your way in, you're at the right place. This is where you're supposed to be. But you got to be dedicated to moving forward. You can't come, become complacent. Because this deen isn't about complacency when it comes to your spiritual progress. Because I want to see y'all and myself at the highest levels of Jannah. Like, hey, them, how you get there, Habibi? Like, I was dropping a halakha, but you up there? No complacency in spiritual progression. Complacency in other things. I'm going to start naming them, right? Complacency in other things. But in this realm... Strive, strive. So he goes, you want to move forward. And then he says, you say to yourself, look at what he says. He says, you say, How can I start worshiping? And I'm covered in these sins. So what do you have to do? You got to hurdle number two, y'all. What do you think hurdle number two is? Getting over sins? Now that's your whole life. He says, Uqba to Tawbah. It's the hurdle of Tawbah. Tawbah. I want to talk about this word. Imam Ghazali is going to go deep later in the book. He's just introducing to us the things that you'll run across the way, but we got we to gotta go into it a little bit. He says, First thing, I have to do Tawbah. So that God can forgive my sins. So that God can forgive these sins and I can move forward. And God can rid me from the evil effects of these sins. And I can purify myself from the dirt of these sins. So that I can be ready for khidmah. You know, one time me and my wife, man, this gathering getting bigger. I can't keep telling my stuff. <laughs> this gathering getting bigger. When it was like 20 people, I'm like, yo, you ass. But now y'all are like, it's too many. So... <laughs> So one time, we, me and wife, we were about to go out, right? So we were waiting on a babysitter, right? And so, like, I'm like, I'm about to go get a workout in real quick. But a babysitter comes. You feel me, Abdullah? So get my push-ups in, get my jog in, right? Sweaty, normal, Texas, right? I come in. Babysitter's here. She's ready to go. I throw on my, my stuff. I'm like, right, I'm ready to go. She's like, no, you ain't. All that sweat, all that, like, you ain't ready to go. You ain't ready for me. Go take a shower. I'm like, oh, my bad. Go shower up. Get ready. Soap, deodorant, <laughs> cologne. She's like, all right, now you ready. Now you ready. My, one of my teachers, he used to say, someone asked him, which is better, salah ala nabi or istighfar? You know, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad or istighfar? He said, no, no, you don't get it. Istighfar is your soap. Salah ala nabi is your itr. It's your perfume. Some of y'all just be putting etter on top of stank. <laughs> there you go. Now you laughing. Yeah, I mean, you do a little istighfar first. Do a little stuff for laws. You know what I mean? Stuff for Allah. And then put on the etter. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. 
No, this is deep. This is deep because, because we're not ready. Look, you don't understand. Hassan al-Basri, he said, sometimes you commit a sin. This is going to sound crazy for us. Sometimes you commit a sin and you're deprived of qiyam al-layl for weeks. For weeks, you, you, you ask him, why can't I get up for tahajr? And in the room right now, it's like, yo, why can't I get up for fajr? And the scholars, they say, because there's a sin. The residue is still there. You're not prepared to go out with wifey. You're like, oh, I want to stay up all night with you, y'all, Allah, in prayer. Allah's... You didn't take a bath. I hope you get it because it shouldn't, it shouldn't demotivate you, though. You shouldn't be sitting there like, oh, tahajr is not for me then. No. He's saying the way that you do this is toba. What does toba mean? Toba simply means to go back. Go back. Every now and then with someone you care about, you'll get into an argument. That's life. And you can walk around each other functionally without actually having a conversation. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Hate them, you know yet? Nah, I'm just joking. <laughs> right? Some, you, you, you like, yo, did you pick up the kids? Like, yeah, I picked the kids. Yeah. Did you take out the garbage? Yeah, I took out the garbage. Yeah. But you ain't really talking to each other. Toba is when you come back to Allah. And you, that eye contact, that, that, that real moment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, that, that, just talk about Toba for a minute. I was talking to uh, Mufti Kamani about this. I like calling mad scholars when I got to teach something. You just hear other people. Mufti Kamani, he was like, oh, you talking about Toba? I was like, yeah. He was like, yo, humility. I was like, what you mean? He was like, you can't do Toba until you're humble. And you know what that reminded me of, y'all? So many of us, we've, it's, it's been about us for so long, about building ourselves, being strong, building your identity, be you, do you, speak your truth, all of that. Toba is all about I'm not where I need to be, and there's a standard outside of me that I'm striving to reach to. Do you feel what I'm saying? The essence of Toba is that humble moment when you're like, yo, I'm slipping up. And I could be better. And I could be better. And on top of that, if that's not motivating, I'm going to share a hadith with you. I'm going to share this beautiful hadith. You may have heard it, but I want you to picture it. As I say it, picture it. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said there's a man. There's a man traveling. He's going on this journey through the desert, and he has his camel with him. And all of his goods, water, everything is on the camel. And he's chilling. He's okay. And he lays down to rest for a bit so that he can sleep under a tree for a little bit. And then when he wakes up, the camel's gone. Picture it. See it. And he looks left. He looks right. He can see the horizons, but no camel. And he realizes, I'm done. I'm finished. It's over. I'll die in minutes out here. So he sits back at the tree, and he accepts his fate, and he falls asleep again. But this time he wakes up, he sees the camel right there, and he jumps up with joy. He jumps up with joy, and he exclaims, Oh Allah, you're my servant, I'm your Lord. Oh my God, I said the wrong thing. And the prophet said, he smiled, and he said he was so happy, he said the wrong words. He was so happy, he said, but then the prophet said, Allah is more pleased with your toba than this man with the camel coming back. What I'm trying to tell you is it's his love language. It's his love language. Most people, you know, I, I call up my boy. I'm like, yo, I'm sorry. He's like, yeah, whatever, man. You know, whatever, right? Allah is like, you sorry. I, I, I love you more. I love you more. I love you more. And this is why. Now are you ready? This is why the Prophet Sallallahu said these words. Yeah, ayyuhan nas. Istaghfirullah wa atubu ilay. Oh, you who believe, seek forgiveness from God and turn back. Toba. Then he said this because I seek forgiveness more than a hundred times in a day. Low key, don't even reveal yourself how many times you say Astaghfirullah today. Prophet Sallallahu said, I did it more than a hundred today. But it goes to show you something. For us, if right now, if I was like Astaghfirullah, y'all be like, what's up? What, what happened? What you do, Shaykh? And the prophet's like, no, no, no. Astaghfirullah is a constant state of constantly turning back. This, this is what we have to understand about istighfar. It's not about a moment. It's about a state of constantly reconnecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So 
You can't do that until you're humble and you stop being the, the God that needs to be worshipped. It's not about you. It's not, Jannah's about you, but right now, you're trying to, to, to push yourself to live according to what the prophet wants. I'm going to go deeper here. Hold up. When you study the life of the prophet, وسلم, you find people around him that were extremely arrogant. And you say to yourself, man, can you imagine they were right there with the prophet and they didn't, like, they weren't humble. But the very same thing that we see in them is exactly within us today. Exact same. Exact same. And they made up all types of excuses. They were like, oh, why does he shop in the, in the souk? <laughs> I ain't going to listen to him. He goes shopping in the souk. Oh, he's not rich. Why would I listen to a prophet that's not rich? They came up with the lamest excuses. But it, it was just an excuse to cover up the fact that their arrogance didn't want them to accept anything. And this is the lesson I want us to understand. The humblest person in this room will reach the highest ranks in this room. The humblest person in this gathering will learn the most today. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, Man tawada alillah, rafa'ahu Allah. Whoever humbles themselves, Allah lifts them up. Man, I, I used to go to this school, right? Where I was studying deen. Um, and it was Ramadan. And there was this one, one uncle, man. He, he used to work for the school. He did everything. You could imagine. He cleaned the vacuums. He, he cleaned the bathrooms. He did everything. If it had to be done, he did it. His name was Rafiq. We called him Rafiq Bai. Right? Rafiq Bai was on another level. He did everything. One day, it was Ramadan. I was doing itikaf in the masjid. I saw a dream. I saw a dream that I was sitting in the saf, just like, like, like he's sitting right here. And there was a member. And Rafiq Bai was on the member, and there was a light. You know how like the mihrab sometimes has a light in it? He was fixing the light. But after he fixed it, he turned it for a moment. He sat there, and everybody was looking up at him. And it was as if in that moment we knew his position. I woke up from the dream. I went to my sheikh. I told him the dream. He's like, it's clear. What you need me for? <laughs> like, why are you telling me the dream is clear? He's the highest of us. Because he believes he's the lowest. The reason why converts excel is because they think, I don't know nothing. And the reason why we don't learn anything is we come in with a cup full. What you going to put in it? So you got to humble yourself in order to learn. And you got to humble yourself in order to pass this next hurdle, which is the hurdle of Toba. And I know it's hard. I know it's hard. You know why it's hard? Because people have told you too many times you're not enough. People around you have told you too many times you're not smart enough. You're not this enough. You're not that enough. You're not this enough. And I'm telling you every night to turn to Allah and say I'm not enough. But I'm telling you from a different way. He loves you though as you are. He loves you as you are. So the beginning of this journey, brothers and sisters, is, is Tawbah. And Tawbah, which is constant, constant, constant turning back to Allah. And I, I, as I was saying before, real quick, hear me out. Like, why, why was the Prophet I'm saying Astaghfirullah like 100 times a day? Like, what was he doing? What was he? And this is why I was telling you about the macros versus just caloric intake. Like, as you start to excel, you start to tweak your game. When I first started running, we was just trying to get time in, like distance. Oh, I ran for a 5K for the first time in my life. Then all of a sudden, my man here, he's like, how's your cadence? I was like, <laughs> cadence? Yeah, like your steps per thing. Like, I'm like, I ain't trying to, I'm trying to just run the race. And so a lot of us in this room, we're like, yo, oh, how's your tasbih hot? How's your qiyamah laid? You in here like, bro, I'm trying to get the fard in. And that's okay. That's beautiful because you're on the path. One time, uh, what's her name? Got her name. Man. One of the sisters in Run Club, man, she said, she hit me. This stuck with me forever. She's like, sometimes you got to walk. Sometimes you got to walk. 
But it's okay, because everybody driving past is jealous of you. Now, y'all don't get it. Y'all don't get it. It ain't hit you. Sometimes you running, right, and you get tired, so you walk. And you feel bad that I got to walk. She's like, nah, don't worry. You're walking. Everybody else is driving. They're like, man, I wish I could get, I could get my steps. I could wish I could I walk. I could wish I could exercise. She's like, nah, don't worry. Look where you're at. So if you're struggling with just the fudd, like, yo, I'm just trying to get fudge. I'm just trying. That's okay. Just never stop moving forward. Don't become complacent and never justify. Because once you justify, you're never going to say sorry. You are never going to say sorry if you justify. So this is, the, this is what he's saying here. It's beautiful. So, uh, subhanAllah. So what is he saying? He's saying sins hold you back. Sins hold you back. So you have to clean that. He's like, but you got to cross this valley, yo. You got to cross this hurdle. You got to get over this hurdle. So that you can get to the purpose. Everyone actually has to go through this hurdle because there's an objective of it. Here we go. Yo, I love this halakha. Listen, listen. There's a hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu said, if, you were to, if all of you were to become to the point where you commit no sins, Allah would destroy you and create a creation that sinned so that they could beg for forgiveness and he forgive them. There is an objective in the sin that you committed. Now, I'm not justifying. Don't walk out of this room like, oh, God's trying to teach me a lesson. Let me go do whatever. But no, after the sin has happened, hear me out. After the sin has happened and you do toba, you can't beat yourself up. Why? Because through that whole relationship, there was something God was teaching you. And that's why Ibn Atta al-Asqandari, he says something deep. You've heard it before. He says, sometimes good deeds destroy you and sometimes bad deeds bring you to the doors of Jannah. What? What? I'll say it again. And I need some Southern Baptist Church vibes for this. Can I tell y'all something funny? Bashir, you want to hear something funny? So I, I, had to, I was coming a little late through the driveway. Don't even forget what I was talking about. I was coming through the driveway, and, um, and the guy was stopping. Like, he has to stop people from coming in. Now, you know, Bashir, my, my, my Spanish is horrible. I don't know nothing, right? I took French. <laughs> right? I'm from Buffalo, so Canada right there. I took, took French, right? So I got to get in, though. He's got to let me in. I got parking back here. But he's like, no. And I'm like, look at me. He's like, they all look the same. <laughs> and I'm like, look at my wife. He's like, no, they all look the same. So I said, I said, uh, padre, padre, right? My wife was like, stop up, padre, like, like the priest, priest. So he moved it, but he started cracking up laughing. Like, bro, you ain't no priest, bro. I get what you're trying to tell me. All right, I don't know why I shared that, but... SubhanAllah. I forgot my train of thought, yo. I was, yeah, I was saying like the purpose of this, the sin. I was saying that sometimes a sin takes you to another level, right? Uh, be, and I'm not saying you justify the sin. What I'm saying is after the fact, when you do that sincere toba, you humble yourself so much that you reach the pleasure of God. But sometimes the righteous deed, you so proud of it, you prayed to Hajjit last night, and you're talking to someone, like, someone's like, man, I miss Fudger. You're like, huh. right? <laughs> Fudger? Huh. Right? Done. Horrible. Might as well slept through Fudger. Might as well not pray to Hajjit, because you missed the purpose of it. You missed what it was all about. So what he's trying to say right here, he's trying to say, that you have to pass this hurdle, not the hurdle of sins, the hurdle of toba. Sins never stop. But we never stop turning back. Sins never stop, y'all. As long as you're breathing. Can I tell you a story? Not like some driveway, some real stuff. Ahmed bin Humble was on his deathbed. On his deathbed. And all of his sons and close people are all around him. And they're saying... La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. Like, say it. But he's like, la, 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 ba'du, la, ba'du, la, la. He's like, no, no, no. So when he came to his senses, they said, yeah, 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 sheikh, like, we were saying, say la ilaha illallah, but you kept saying la. And he was like, no, I didn't even hear y'all. 
Shaitan was telling me that I made it finally, that I'm a friend of God. I made it. And I was like, nope, not yet. Nope, not yet. Nope, not yet. What I'm trying to tell you is sins aren't going to stop. But the same way Shaitan makes it his job to make you trip up, you make it your job to go back home. That's it. That's the key. That's the key. Every night. And don't judge anyone. Because you don't know how much that person cries at night for the sin. That's all I can say to you. Do not, do not judge. Because you have no idea how much they cry at night for that sin. And you don't know how you're going to end up. You don't know how you're going to end up. And everything is based on that last moment. So what does he say? He says, He's like, so what you have to do is do iqama. Real quick, Arabic, right? Iqama. We use that same word for prayer. So the same way you establish prayer, establish toba. So what are we going to do tonight? Astaghfirullah. On your way back home. Astaghfirullah, 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 astaghfirullah. There's a hadith I love. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi he said, Tuba, 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 glad tidings. Liman wajida fi sahifatihi istighfar and kathira. Glad tidings to the one who finds a lot of astaghfirullah in their scrolls on the day of judgment. Not sins, who cares? You kept coming home, you kept coming back. Allahu Akbar. So the word iqamah here, what does it mean, y'all? Establish it. It's not a one-time thing. So every night, man, before you go to sleep, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. Fall asleep with that on your tongue, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. But then he goes, but you got to do it the right way. There's conditions to it. There's a way to do toba, And he's going to talk about that later in the, in the book. So he brings us to the third hurdle, third hurdle. By the way, each one of these, he's going in way more depth. He's just introducing them. فَلَمَّا حَصَلَتْ لَهُ tawbah. Once you've gotten true toba, wafaragha, and now you've you've passed this hurdle. Don't get too happy, right? Not yet. Hanna ila al Now you've done toba. You're ready. You're like, yo, I'm ready to worship. I'm ready to do qiyamul layl. All of this, I'm ready. Liyakhuda fiha, fanadara. And all of a sudden, you look around. Faida hawlahu awaq. Around you, you are surrounded by by what he uses awaq, which means hindrances, hindrances. Now remember, I told you Ghazali is the king of uh, bullet points. So hurdle number three has four of them, all right, y'all? All right? But it's beautiful. Look what he says. He says each one of them is enough to stop you, but I'm going to teach you how to tr- cross them. He's like, so I thought about them, and there's four of them. What are they? Y'all ready? A dunya. This dunya, this dunya, we got to talk about what is the dunya? Like a lot of people come in these gatherings and we use these terms, right? Dunya, what is dunya? Dunya is everything of this world that isn't connected to Allah. Everything in this world that you could love and the love of it fill your heart that isn't connected to Allah. It's dani, it's the thing that's close to you. We'll talk about it more, don't worry. Well, khalq. Number two thing that gets in the way, hindrance, is people. The biggest thing when I converted, y'all, was the people. I told y'all last week, yo, Mike's wearing a dress now. People. People. And and you know what? Are you someone who's deeply affected by what people think about you? I am. But you know who else was? Our prophet, Sai Salam. Our prophet's like, that's, I'm not about to tell you, oh, don't worry. I'm about to tell you it's hard. You're going to struggle with this, and eventually you'll reach a point in life where you're like, I'm good. I know myself. I'm, I'm good in my skin. But the prophet, Sai Salim, can I tell you a story? He came down from the mountain after Gabriel hugged him. You know the story. He came down from the mountain. He ran to his wife. She said, we're going to my cuz. He knows all about this religious stuff. So they went to Waraka bin Nawfal. And Waraka, he's an old man. He was studying all the ancient scriptures, Christianity, Judaism, everything. So he says, what did you see, son? The prophet explains it to him. Oh, man, you saw the Namus al-Akbar. You saw the great angel. 
And then he slips up. He slips up. He goes, man, I wish I would be alive when they kick you out of this city. The prophet says, something's like, hold up, hold, hold up, hold up, hold up, cousin Waraka. <laughs> I love y'all, yo. Yo, I love it because I can be myself, yo. Y'all not judging, yo. I'll be going to other communities, like, <laughs> I mean, like, it's, it's all right. <laughs> anyways, nah, he says, he says, he says, is like, oh, he tells him straight up. He goes, yeah, no, no person came with this message except that their people kicked them out. But he even says, They're going to kick me out? Why does he say me? Because they all love him. He's Amin. He's a trustworthy. He built this stellar reputation. But what I'm trying to tell you is if you're someone who's impacted by what people think about it, you're not alone. That's exactly how the prophet felt. But he struggled and got over that slowly. Slowly. You know, having to watch my children grow, I don't know if they're listening to me. So my, my, Maria started putting on her hijab, right? I ain't tell her. She's just watching y'all. And, and I realize what that does, you know, when it's done out of one's volition. Like, you, you, you choose, I'm going to walk in the room and be different. And I, I'm, all I can say is where my brother's at, yo. Imam Zay Shakir, he says the minimum that a Muslim in America should wear, dress code-wise, you don't need a throw. He said you should rock a kufi, though. I, I, I ain't trying to judge you. I ain't judging nobody. Right? Sometimes I don't wear mine. All right, chill. I'm just saying what he, I think it's important for us to recognize the sisters that's holding this dean on their back, yo. Are we not going to give them props for that? Are we not going to be like, you're repping when no one else is? When you could be like, como estas? <laughs> yeah, some of us. So, 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 I, I, takbir for the sisters, man. Takbir. I mean, and it's not easy. Every moment repping the dean, it's times I just run in the gym real quick, put a hat on. Like, I ain't trying to rep right now. I'm trying to do reps. <laughs> for real. Just trying to do reps. Sisters, like, I'm always repping the dean, no matter what. And so, I didn't plan this, but, man. SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah. So what does he say? The creation will be a hurdle, y'all. Other people and converts know. I was talking to a convert last week. He's like, I'm Muslim now. Do I tell my parents? I was like, no, yo. <laughs> Shh, quiet. Build yourself first. Build yourself first. So he's going to talk more detail about the creation because it's something we all struggle with. Then he says, shaitan, that's the third part of this hurdle. I mean, come on, know thy enemy. We kind of went in on it, right? And then he says, one nafs, one nafs. Oh, man, what is the nafs? We use these Islamic terms without really knowing what they mean. Real quick, what is the nafs? We're going to talk about it in more detail. The nafs, the best analogy is the inner child, yo, that loves immediate gratification. It's the inner child that doesn't care about the consequences of anything so long that it feels good and it's good to have right now. Your four-year-old son, daughter, brother, sister will eat cookies till their teeth drop out. Unless you be like, yo, stop. Brush your teeth. They will not take a shower. They won't eat dinner. They'll do literally, literally, a nafsu katifal. Imam Busaidi says, a nafsu katifal. The nafs is just the inner child. So here's the deal. What do we do about this nafs? Listen to what he says. He goes, you got to cross these hurdles. These four things in hurdle three, you got to get over these. Well, if not, they're not going to let you do ibadah. The nafs ain't going to let you wake up for fajr. That nafs is not going to let you wake up for tahajr, y'all. But if you have a flight, it, the nafs like, we got to get there. All of a sudden, the nafs is like, we'll wake up. You waking five minutes early. You got a flight, the nafs is literally waking you up. You got a job interview? Oh, the nafs is like, we got to make this dough, get up. 
But Fudger, the nafs is like, nah, wh why? Why? I say that because you have the potential in you. We never miss flights, y'all. Not for sleep, regardless of the time. So for those who say, like, I can't, it's not you. You can. You know you can. But we just have to s change something inside our mind to allow us to have that same level as missing a flight cost me $300 and missing a fudger cost me. That's it. So what does he say? You got to cross this. How will you do it? You need four things. You need to get rid of all that dunya. You got to get rid of all that extra stuff. You got to stop surprising yourself with Amazon every other day. <laughs> Less is more. Less is more. And, 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 and for those who can have it, I'll say it this way. I wrote this down. You can have it, but don't let it have you. Meaning, you own it. It doesn't own you. What do you mean by that? Some of us in this room, if something that we own gets destroyed, our hearts break. I'm not talking about sentimental, your mom gave it, whatever. Our hearts break. They say that the salaf, they had the dunya in their hand. The problem is we got the dunya in our heart. You get one little scratch on that car, you angry at the world. You're, you're done. So, so you can have the dunya. And he's actually saying you got to like let it go for a while. But you got to make sure it doesn't have you. And the way you could tell, you got to try this, yo. I'm only sharing this. I'm only sharing this as I want someone. I think we can learn from it. I know this shake, right? He was rocking this, uh, this scarf, right? This, this shawl, shawl, shawl. And it was, it was nice, yo. I was watching the, listening to the lecture, but the whole time I was like, dang, is that like, a Gucci scarf or something like <laughs> the whole the pattern on it was like is that Persian <laughs> like I was like that's amazing it's, it's so nice so after the lecture I, I meet him I was like yo yo it was an amazing talk it was so whatever by the way that that Shaw is beautiful and he just literally was like Shoo, and put it on me I was like no 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 low-key I was like yo. <laughs> <laughs> And I asked him, I was like, what, you don't like it? He's like, I love it. I said, you don't like it? He goes, I love it. I was like, I can't. He's like, now you have to. You have to now. I'm fighting my love for it. I'm fighting my love for it. I, was, I got the shawl till today. <laughs> if one of y'all see it on me, you better not say nothing. <laughs> Mashallah. No, no, that, that's because he said, I love it. He said, no, I love it, meaning I do like it, but I can't let it take over my heart. I can't let it take over my heart. Another shawl will come. I'm putting it forward to Jannah. I do love it. That's why I'm going to give it to you in the path of God. How many more shawl he's got because of that? Allah knows best. When muharaba ma'a shaitan, you have to fight shaitan. Alhamdulillah, we have a whole series on that. And then he says, then you have to go against the nafs. But listen, he goes, y'all ready? The nafs is the hardest one. The nafs is the hardest one. Why? He says it's the hardest because it's, it's in you. It is you. And he says that the, the prophet taught us that you need to take care of yourself to go on this journey. So you can't just destroy your, yourself. Let me give an example. The nafs is that appetite where at 10 p.m. you go open the fridge and you just look at stuff. <laughs> yup, you just be looking at stuff. Like, did wifey leave any chicken for me? Right? You're not hungry. You could go to sleep easily. But you just kind of like, the nafs is just like, let's just check the fridge. <laughs> That's the nafs, right? Now listen, listen, let's go deep a little bit here. Imam Ghazali says, why did God put that in us? Because if a, if a child was patient and it didn't cry when it needed food, it would die. It would die like, yo, you need food. It's like, no, I'm good. Done. So, so Imam Ghazali says, these, 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 
these desires that God put in us, they keep us alive. But I'll never forget something that my dad said to me when I was young. And it always hit me wrong. And then when I became Muslim, I learned the complete opposite. And may Allah guide him to Islam. Amen. He said, I, I, I used to eat very fast. I don't eat fast no more. Right? I used to eat very fast as a kid, like most teenagers. So my, 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 my dad was like a renaissance man, you know, um, whatever. So he said to me one day, he said, son, stop. Stop. We don't eat to live. Y'all heard this before. We live to eat. As if to say, enjoy this. This is what life is all about. And I was kind of like, okay, cool. And then when I became Muslim in the Prophet I was like, yo, one third. Just eat enough. Don't overeat. Just take care of yourself en just enough. And I saw that this desire to consume while it keeps me alive, it could destroy me. Obesity, addiction, that's enough left unchecked, destroying the human being from inside out because all they ever did was listen to it. And there's a whole lot of psychological reasons all that, but I'll give an example. So the nafs is the hardest one. Why is the nafs so difficult? He says because you can't kill it because it's you, but you can't listen to it either because it will destroy you. You'll be addicted to whatever. So what do you do? You know what he says? He uses a great analogy. You know a horse, they put, what's it called? Uh, brittle? It's called brittle? Bridle, sorry, my bad. Dang, bridle. <laughs> thank you, though, thank you. Uh, the bridle, right? They put the bridle. He said, you got to put a bridle of taqwa in your nafs. Where you just hold in that joint. Like, we're going to eat. Oh, but is it halal? Hold up. Hold up, chill out. I'll let you know when it's time. No, for real. It's beautiful. Right? Oh, you want to sleep? Oh, I'll let you know when it's time to sleep and when we're going to get up. But at Ramadan, sleep is crazy. But that taqwa is like, I'll tell you when it's time to sleep. No, it's tarawi time right now. We're going to stay up. Okay, cool. So he says the way you do that is the only way you could do it is you put the bridle? <laughs> I'm going to say it wrong. You put the bridle of taqwa in its mouth. You know, that's a Texas. You know Texans be knowing that stuff, right? <laughs> I bet you she was born here, too. <laughs> no, this, this is beautiful. Does everyone understand the analogy? It's an amazing analogy. Okay, let's keep going. The journey ain't over, y'all. Now he says that you get to another, you pass this one. You, 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 you started to train your nafs. You, you, you fight shaitan every day. You don't worry about what people say. In the dunya, you have it, but it doesn't have you. And by the way, these are things we keep struggling with every day we wake up. You get to the next stage. Now, I want to reiterate. Some of you are like Sheikh, but you didn't further, you know, explain how to. He, no, he's going to explain all that. He's just introducing us to each one of these hurdles that are in the way. Once you've passed that previous one, now you want to worship. Now, this one's a deep one. This one hits me. Every one of these hits us all differently. This one hits me specifically. He says, He goes, the next is you're going to find these impediments that keep you busy. I like to call this the hurdle of keeping you busy, keeping you preoccupied. Let me explain something. Ibadah takes free time. Ibadah takes free time. It takes time. And he says that this next hurdle is the hurdle about constantly staying busy with something. But what is it that we stay busy with? Here we go. He says, oh, he says, the way you stop this one, what the sudduhu anil farag, it stops you from being having open time. Lidarika kama yambari. Like that's what you need. You need free time in order to worship. He goes, I told you he's the king of drop-down menus. He goes, there's four of these. There's four of these. Number one, the thing that preoccupies you. You could be doing ibadah, but this, what does he say? Risk, sustenance, risk. The word is risk. What is risk? Non-rhetorical question, what is risk? Oh, money, exactly. A lot of us think it's money. Uh-uh. Risk is everything. 
sustenance. Everything you get, every breath, every drink, every, every hug from a loved one, every smile that you receive, anything you get in life, marriage, everything, that's all risk. That's all risk in Arabic. Our sustenance, what we get, what we get, our share. Tutalibuhu nafs, your nafs says to you, yo, we got to grind, we got to make money. And it's true, we'll talk about that. Oh, and you drop in the dunya and you're leaving all these people off, how are we going to live? How are we going to survive? So that's the first thing that keeps us busy. Work, 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 work. Now I'm looking at a room of highly educated people and overachievers. Some of y'all like, dang. <laughs> I saw a few of y'all like sit up, like, yeah, you know. <laughs> you were saying. <laughs> no, a lot of us, you know, mashallah, we, we, we put in the work. But w when are you going to, when is enough enough, though? We talked about this like a few halakas back. Like at what point are you good? Huh? Yeah, content. What point, what salary are you good at? Hana'a and contentment. What salary? Where? Where? At what point? I think that's something so important to really think about because all of us just keep going up the ladder and we, we end up dying at the top of it, looking still up like, dang, I could have still, you know, opened up another business, opened up this. Now, don't get me wrong. Uthman bin Affan, Sahaba were very wealthy, but they didn't let that preoccupation take them from their true occupation, which was to stay on this path to get back to our true destination back home. So what I'm trying to tell you is it's not about the wealth. I'm not hating on rich people, wealthy people. I'm hating on people that make wealth the object, object of their life. And that's why the Prophet Sallallahu he said, listen closely, Ta'isa, cursed be these two people, Abdul Dinar wa Abdul Dirham wa Abdul Khamisa. Cursed be the servant of a dime, the servant of silver, and the servant of clothes. Cursed be them. And then he explained them. He said, in, in if they get it, they're happy. If they don't, they're sad. Don't be a servant of that stuff. That's the key. That's the key. So what does he say? The first thing that preoccupies you is risk, risk, risk. My sustenance, my sustenance, my sustenance. Number two. Man, how many of us, this is us. Al-akhtar min kulli shay'in. Our thoughts and worries about everything, everything, takhafu, that we're worried about or we hope for or we want. But we don't know how it's going to turn out because outcomes are hidden. So hold on. There's so many things in life we make a decision, but the outcome is hidden. We don't know how it's going to turn out. We ask people, we do mashwara, should I go to this school, should I not? Should I take this job, should I, should I not? Now, one thing you can do is worry all day about the outcomes. It's like when, you're, when your manager is getting replaced with another manager and you and that manager were great. Now you lose sleep. Oh my God, who am I gonna get, who am I gonna get? I ask you a question. Does worrying about it more change reality? No, it doesn't, you just wasted time. No, for real, I'm not trying to belittle your struggle. I'm actually trying to empower you so that you can look at what you can do instead of what you can't do. You don't control that next manager, and worrying it is a waste of time. About it is a waste of time. So what he says is, You don't free yourself to worship because you're just sitting there in thought, thinking so deeply about what if, what if, what if, what if. And this is where a beautiful hadith comes into play. The Prophet ﷺ, he said that the word what if is how shaitan opens a door. What if this? What if that? What if this? What if that? Let's keep going. Number three thing that preoccupies us from ibadah. Is it mugger time? Huh? Two minutes? Okay. Shada'id wal masa'ib. Hardships, calamities. Hardships and calamities. When the calamities come, it's hard to worship. So what are you going to do in that moment? He'll tell us. And last but not least, he says, our destiny, our fate, things that are written for us, the good and the bad. Whenever something bad happens, the nafs is upset. 
The nuts just gets totally thrown off. And when you're mad, you're mad at God. You got a flat tire, you're upset with God. Oh my God, I was supposed to be here. I was supposed to be here, da, da, da. The opposite quality is red law, contentment. So what does he say? We're, we're going to conclude in a minute. He goes, so guess what? You're going to need four things to get over these four specific problems. Number one, you ready? To get over the problem of worrying about risk, you have to have what's called tawakkul, complete trust. It's written, y'all. It's good. You're good. Number two, worry about outcomes. I'm going to introduce you to a word that will change your life if you act on it. You ready? Tafweed. In Arabic, it's called tafweed. Yaqub, he said, wa ufawidu amri ila Allah. Fawidu, the best translation, I'll tell y'all, is let go, let God. How do Christians say it? No, for real. Let go. Complete tafweed is like, I don't even, I let go completely. I put it in the application. I ain't even worried. You meet somebody like, oh, you're not worried. Are you going to get the job? You're like, <laughs> But does that mean you slacked? You didn't do your job? No, you did everything. You did everything. I don't got control right now. Column applications closed now. What do I do? Tough weed is a heavy thing because you don't realize some of y'all in this room, I want you right now, please, let's, let's, let's do this exercise together. I want you to think about that thing that is that, that what if that's troubling you the most right now. That it could go to one of two ways. Think about it. Don't look at me. Think about it. Think about it. You got it? Once you got it, I want you to think about that thing. It could go this way. It could go that way. It might go this way. And right now, I just want you to be just in your mind, just say, just let it go. Ya Allah, it's up to you. Say that to yourself. It's up to Allah. I'm good. If you do it correctly, you'll just see this weight lift, y'all. Just in that moment, just let, it, let go of it. If you do it right, the weight will lift. And that's what the deen gives you. That ease. That comfort. You read Allah bikum al yusra. Allah wants ease for you and not difficulty. He's like, I got you. I got you. But you're like, no, I could do it. I got you. No, I could do it. He's like, I got you. I always had you. I always will have you. Allahu Akbar. What about the difficulties, the calamities? How do we get past that? Well, you know. Sabah. Sabah. Patience. And what about our destiny, the changes, the good and the bad? Ridha. It's a concept. It means contentment. Build contentment. I'm good either way. It's easier said than done. But the next time, you know when I like to do it the most? Y'all ready? Like when you stub your toe. So I have like this desk in my office. I keep stubbing my toe on this joint, right? But that's my Ridha table. Because <laughs> whenever I stub my toe on it, I'm like, alhamdulillah. <laughs> There's something Allah wanted from me for that. It happens all the time. I almost, I was walking out the door, you know the thobes, like why is the pocket right at the doorknob level? <laughs> the brother's like, yeah, I feel you, Habibi. <laughs> the next time you walk in it, you just, Ridha, what are you gonna do now? Alhamdulillah, ya Allah. This, maybe this thobe was making me a little arrogant. For real, maybe there was something this was doing to my nafs. Take this all and put something else on right now. Ridha, contentment with, with however it comes. Does it make you lazy? No, you keep striving to do whatever. But once you hit something and Allah's like, eh, stop. You're like, okay, what can I do? Nothing else I could do. I'm going to fix that tire with a smile on my face. That's it. So, falamma. Oh, man. I think we got to kind of wrap it up here, y'all. It's so beautiful though, right? Allahu Akbar. Nah, yo, I'm doing it. <laughs> so listen, listen, look at what he says next. Now you got past these things that busy you, right? You got past these things that busy you. Then, then you get to the next thing. Guess what? So, so remember, you, you learned what you needed to do. You did toba. Now you, you, you got past your nafs. You're dealing with nafs, shaitan. You pushed all that away, right? Then you cleared your mind. You're like, no, this is ibadah time. I'm not worried about nothing. He goes, guess what you get hit with? He says, you get hit with being lazy. 
Fatiratun kasla. You don't feel like it. And I really like this one because of our time. He goes, Wala tan shatu. You don't have the vigor to do it. Wala tan ba'ith ila khair. You don't feel like being pushed to do good. Like you should. Wa inna ma mayluha. But you always want to chill and relax and do nothing. Man, I was reading this and I was like, man, how many of us, we get in that spiritual rut where we just sit there and we don't feel like doing anything, y'all. And the longer it goes, the worse you feel. You're like, I don't feel like doing anything. The moment that hits, I go run, yo. Something, get up, move. Move around, do something. Don't let that stay on you. But what does he say? Hold on. Let's listen to him, not me. Bel ila sharrin. He goes, not even just chilling. The chilling doing nothing actually leads to evil. At first, you were just chilling doing nothing. But that eventually led to you being where you're not supposed to be. To further sins. Subhanallah. Wa fudulin, wa baliyatin, wa jahalatin, ignorance, dumb stuff. Fahtaj ma'aha'i. So you need something that's going to push you. You need something that's going to invigorate you away from evil and to actually get busy. So now you need two things. You need to build your hope and or build your fear. Like, uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to keep my Quran tight. I memorized the Quran, alhamdulillah. But to, to, to keep the Quran is a journey, yo. You, know, you got to like read all the time. Sometimes you don't feel like doing it. But you know what I think about? What if I lost all of it? I'm like, nah, yo, let's go. I'll call my man up. Yo, you coming over? Yo, we're about to read. For real. That fear. That fear. That fear. But some of us in this room, hold up. Some of y'all are carrot people. <laughs> Come on, y'all know. Y'all like, yo, don't threaten me, please. <laughs> You're like, just tell me what I could strive to become. And that's where it's like, what if I knew the whole Quran and I didn't even have to pick up the Mus'haf? I'm like, oh, I could become that. And now all of a sudden I'm like, yo, here we go. Yo. But so fear and hope. But you got to tap into you. You got to tap in what motivates you. So he says you need fear and hope. He goes, فَرِّجَاءُ مِنْ عَظِيمِ الثَّوَابِ you got to hope in the reward that God has promised you. And you got to remind yourself with fear about the punishment that God has, has told you about. Min alim iqab Allah azza wa jal. You got to think about what Allah has, has warned us of in the hereafter, in this life. This is the hurdle of incentives, the thing that pushes you. Some of us, we feel lazy. I don't feel like it. There's, I'm free. I just don't feel like getting up and praying or reading Quran. None of the previous hurdles, they're all past. There's only one thing, I feel lazy, I don't feel like doing it. Well, what do I do? He's like, hope and fear, you need to tap into those things. And you need to connect your hopes and fears to that actions to motivate you. We got one more hurdle he's going to talk about. That we'll do next week, inshallah ta'ala. Inshallah ta'ala. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. This is a blessed gathering, mashallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward everyone. May Allah make, give us the ability to uh, follow what we have heard. May Allah give us the ability to act upon what we have learned. May Allah keep us amongst righteous people. May Allah give us the ability to make that next step, which is tawbah, and to become people of tawbah. May Allah make us people, uh, a tawabun. people are always coming back to him. Ya Allah, we ask you, to, to accept us, Ya Allah, and forgive us for our shortcomings. Ya Arhamar Rahimin. Subhana Rabbika Rabbil Izzati Amma Yasifun. Wa Salamun Alal Mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen.